Hello, everyone. We are Education for the 21st Century, a monthly podcast brought to you by the Center for Developing Urban Educational Leaders and the College of Education at Lehigh University. We focus on challenging issues present in the U.S. educational system and in our society today. We bring attention to concerns in areas such as educational leadership, school and community, innovation, research to practice, and social and cultural dynamics in schools, bringing together experts to discuss challenges and present solutions. Unfortunately, Dr. Beecham is unable to join us today, but I'm so honored to say that we have two very special guests today. And because of this, our structure will be a little bit different than previous episodes. Dr. Irene Yoon is uh, Associate Professor of Educational Leadership and Policy at the University of Utah. Her research is about humanization, radical love, and critical hope. Overall, she is interested in intersecting forces of race, class, gender, and disability in teacher learning and school-wide culture and structure. Her book in progress tells the story of a school that is powered by hauntings and a beloved community to create full inclusion for students of color with emotional and behavioral disability labels. You can find her on Twitter at Hong Won, H-O-N-G-W-O-N, or online at irenemune.com. Her information is included in the description below. And today we also have Dr. Jessica Liu, and she is a second generation born in the US, Taiwanese Chinese American, earlier career professional in the field of counseling psychology, whose interests lie in the power of relationships as a way to heal and grow. Her research has focused heavily on the impact of intergenerational cultural conflicts in Taiwanese Chinese American families, she seeks to explore how similar dynamics of intergenerational and intercultural conflicts also manifest in professional environments, specifically with a focus on how, the impact, how it impacts ways in which healing occurs or does not occur. She is especially passionate about practices that promote relational healing and the reconnection of disembodied experiences that have been silenced by racism and other forms of oppression. Thank you so much for being here today. Thanks for having us. Thanks for the invitation. And it's interesting, as I'm reading through these bios, I'm seeing almost this trend in both of your work as this piece of resilience and growth. And it's really interesting how your work inter intersects in that way. Now, as we move on to this next, sec our first question here, I'm, I'm curious because uh, Dr. Liu, you identify your Taiwanese Chinese American identity. And um, the reason I bring this up is because sometimes we don't necessarily identify with our own, our own identity or often within in settings or often people generalize and tend to group or characterize individuals without really taking into consideration one's background or heritage. So I'm, I wonder, you know, why is, that identity is so important to you. And then I would also like to ask Dr. Yoon, um, how, how do you identify um, with, with your own identity? Yeah. Yeah, thanks for, for noticing that. Um, and, you know, the explicitness of my Taiwanese Chinese American identity is simply one facet of my, my identity, right? Among the myriad of other ones. But I make that explicit because in many ways in speaking about relationships, it's a way to honor my relationships with my ancestors, and my roots, right? Um, my mom's side, my maternal side was born and my mom was born in Taiwan. And, you know, my grandmother was really an Aboriginal, grew up in the mountains of Taiwan, really an indigenous folk um, in Taiwan before the colonization, you know, with Japan actually and all of that. And, and uh, my paternal side identifies as, um, is from China. And so 
Um, I have Chinese roots from that. And I, and I make explicit both because, you know, the Asian experience is not just one homogenous experience. There's a lot of variability in that. And when I make that explicit, it's my way to make explicit that that relationship that I have with my ancestors is important and it matters. And you and you carry them and, and their past and their heritage with you and moving forward, I would imagine. Yeah. Every moment. Mm. Even right now. <laughs> Dr. Yoon. Um yeah, I'm wanting to comment on what Jessica said. <laughs> I'm not I'm gonna stay focused. So uh <laughs> Thank you for asking. I am Korean American. Um, I identify as a Korean American woman of color. Um, and I think part of that is um, because, you know, what what I have experienced is specifically as an East Asian woman is that um, often people forget that we are people of color, that we are not white. Um, I think that our you know, I really dislike the term white adjacency or white adjacent. Um, but uh, I think that, you know, because of the perception or that we get read as white adjacent, um, you know, I try to be very consciously explicit about the, the fact that like I identify in solidarity with black indigenous and women of color of, um, you know, that we are, we are not only all experiencing racism, but also honoring that ha how we experience racism really differently and have really different histories in this country. So trying to hold both of that, um, that's how I try to identify myself. Yeah, and it's interesting too, how sometimes we may not, or those who create these constructs, putting us in certain categories, how much weight that can that can carry as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's still so limiting, you know, like the like the term woman can be read as being inclusive or excluding um, femmes and queer or trans gender nonconforming folks. And so it's like very everything is political, you know, so I think the way I identify is trying to signal something um, to other people. And I think that that's also what Jessica was referring to, like trying to signal like how layered Asia's history is even within itself, um, not to mention bringing that into the US <laughs> and um, how that changes shape in the US or gets erased in different ways and trying to bring it back. Wow, that's powerful too, you know, how that gets erased and, and quite literally, you know, that that occurs. Wow. Um, so I'm gonna move on to the next question here. And this this goes to both of you as well. How have your experiences informed your professional endeavors and personal relationships? And maybe I'll add as well, what has your experience been like living in the US? as a person of Asian descent, you know, carrying, carrying that identity with you. Dr. Yoon, go ahead. Well, I was gonna, I was jumping in to say, Jess, you feel free to go. <laughs> but, um, so a little bit of background. Um, I have always felt very much neither fully Korean nor fully American. Um, I was born in the United States and um, grew up in a majority white town, suburban town. Um, but I had weekends where, you know, I attended a Korean American church. And so I was around Koreans all weekend. Um, and it, it, and sort of like, during the week, you know, I never felt excluded or, you know, pushed out, but I also never really felt included. And so I would get comments in both places about how I didn't quite belong or my belonging was by being 
unacknowledged or unrecognized. Um, and I think that that, that practice of, of like trying not to erase people, of acknowledging who they are is part of why I found it powerful that Jessica, you embedded your identity into your um, bio biography. Um, it's part of why like land acknowledgements are so important, but they're so limited, right? I think that for me being Asian American has been like this really strange both and neither nor. Um, and, you know, land acknowledgements to take that example. Um, as a Korean American immigrant, I'm a settler here. So I'm part of that practice of, of you know, colonizing and ongoing um, trauma and erasure, but I'm also someone who whose family is here because of a very similar sort of imperial impulse internationally. So <clears throat> I I think that that's sort of been that's captured my experience. Like I don't speak Korean per like very well at all. And so, um, you know, language is so tied to culture, but like, I've also really tried to increasingly grow really close to um, understanding history and culture and like identifying um, parts of me that are Korean and just like trying to be as fierce as possible about the fact that like I am Korean and no one can take that away from me. So don't even try. Um, and I think it's just been this constant process of growing. Um, you know, this past year I've been on sabbatical and it's been really beautiful. And I think a lot of it has been exploring like my Koreanness, my Korean Americanness, um, and like where are the places that I can like live in a way that is like unapologetically Korean American and like isn't about like ooh, creating a counter narrative or like, you know, um, like talking back to whiteness. It's like, no, I, I just am gonna live and be like super Korean American. <laughs> um, and I think that that, um, that's been really important in terms of understanding how much I have moved over for whiteness and white supremacy um, and how much I have, like, how much of my experiences has been like learning how to move aside. And I think um, that's encapsulated a lot of what I've been experiencing. And I know that sounds vague, but I, I think that that's sort of a, an overall view <laughs> as best as I can give one. I mean, it, like just said, you know, we're all so different. Um, we're a hugely heterogeneous, diverse group. Um, and even among Koreans, like my experience is super different. My family is super different from other Korean Americans that I know. Um, our histories in Korea are different and that translates differently in the US. And so I think if I try to speak in general terms, it would be about like just claiming the in-between. Yeah, I just sort of noticed myself take a deep sigh to that in-between. Because yeah, I, I really can resonate too with that sentiment of not being Asian enough, but not being American enough, right? And I, you know, over time, I've really been able to recognize like, what is this not American enough? And it's still, it's this sort of internalized racism that subtly plays in the background of like, I'm not white enough, right? Because to be American is to be white. And um, I eat hot pot for Christmas. Right, like the only holiday I celebrate is the Lunar New Year, right? And 
that's that's me, right? But I don't really know the roots of where Lunar New Year, Chinese New Year came from, right? I just know we eat and, but, you know, so this world of not being Asian enough, but not being American enough is, is something that definitely um, is so salient for me as well. And, and so to answer, you know, going back to your question to Sheena of how has it formed both my professional endeavors and per personal relationships, um, it's, it's, my identities have just made me more conscientious of the way that I show up. Right. It's made me more intentional about the spaces that I want to be in, um, the projects that I involve myself in, the relationships that I have, the relationships that I choose not to have. Right. And this is oftentimes in relationships, not just with human beings. Right. Um, but I'm talking about relationships with systems, relationships with thoughts and feelings that I have. Right. Um, you know, relationships with. You know, I think, you know, one big thing that came to mind as Irene was sort of talking is sort of the, you know, when she highlighted the ongoing colonizing of trauma and erasure, I think back to, you know, what I spent um, much of my, my doctoral endeavor studying, you know, as I mentioned, intergenerational cultural conflicts. And, um, you know, I found myself as I, you know, there's this robust amount of literature around just the existence of, and a lot of the literature highlights, you know, the impacts of these, you know, conflicts within family systems. And, you know, for by the end of my dissertation, I found myself wanting to understand, like, what if we engage in some perspective taking, you know, if, if some of the children try to take the perspective of their parents, what's going on and see what's happening. And, um, you know, when I think back to the way that Asian American literature is often discussed or Asian American values in terms of, you know, collectivistic harmony and saving face and filial, I just feel like sometimes the way in which the Asian American experience is described is also a really white colonized perspective, right? Like, totally. Wh what if, like the reason why these conflicts are happening is because there's actually a lot of intergenerational trauma that's happening and that these conflicts are actually a space wherein there's a feeling, there, there's a desire, I don't know, there's something about it where um, maybe in the endeavor of trying to, you know, sort of, exist in this white supremacist country, right? And never feeling like one belongs. And there's this constant feeling of, oh, we're having this conflict because my parents want me to do better and get better grades and they're such tiger moms. And it's like, well, what if it's actually their, my parents' trauma of never feeling like they're good enough in their immigration history. And maybe that's what's manifesting in that conflict. And are we naming it as that, or is it just then put on as, oh, that's a Asian American mom issue or dad issue because Asian mom issue, because I think the more than that's othered, the more than I think it allows the perpetuation of white supremacy, right? Because then the focus then becomes this like, intracultural conflict, right? And then we, you know, as Asian American community, we're not getting along, you know, and it's, it's a beautiful play on of, you know, for, for uh, you know, just like for white supremacy to just perpetuate and do its thing. Because as long as then as a community, we're not getting along and like feeling these conflicts um, rather than seeing that actually the bigger monster here is, is white supremacy, right? And how is that as an overarching concept really affecting that and, and so, you know, th this has been more of a evolving of how my identity uh, as I relate with my Asian American identity has sort of evolved, you know, um, in that experience. Um, so, yeah, it's a, it's quite a thought to be with sometimes. Yeah. And it's amazing how, and I'd imagine it's difficult, you know, you look at the literature or you look at your culture or what people are telling you, whether it be scholarly articles or people that you love, how can you not internalize that and make that into who you are, being able to kind of take that step back and say, well, maybe it's because of 
these larger, larger things that are at play that are actually affecting the system in which we live in um, is, is very powerful. And I'm, I'm just reflecting on my own heritage, thinking about Native Americans um, and how there is that internalized fighting and kind of self-hate as well. But it's, um, even if we think it may be powerful or not, it, it impacts us psychologically and thereby, you know, we internalize it. And as you both were saying, that, that piece of generational trauma. And so thinking about this, thinking about this past year, and Irene, as you said, this year, you've really taken that time to even, you know, reflect on your own identity. Could you describe your perspective on racial discrimination against Asian Americans um, during the COVID-19 pandemic and thinking about that as well? What has your experience been like as an Asian woman trying to advocate for racial justice issues? Well, that's a small question. So, um, <laughs> so I think that a lot of my perspective has has been trying to hold many many things at once, um, and trying to constantly remind. Um, remind people around me, like, there's so much more to the story. Like, like, I think that there's a lot of, there are narratives in the US about Asians being meek or quiet or like willing to oblige. And I think what the racial, like the very like vivid anti-Asian hate um, which has always occurred, um, but, you know, very publicly, um, during COVID, um, I think that what that has sort of had people realize is how much anger <laughs> Asian Americans have and, um, like righteous anger is for Koreans, at least it's, it's a, it's a cultural thing. Um, I think like feeling this, this rage against injustice that's also sort of mixed with like almost a, like a fatalism or like a, a, a concern that things will never change. I think that really impacts the ways that I've been sort of trying to balance or, or manage multiple feelings, right? There's this like, completely like I feel it in my body of like sorrow and pain and absolute rage and then also fear there's so much anxiety and fear um and then also feeling like again to go back to that like whether or not I'm Asian or Korean enough there's almost like that fakeness right because I live in a like class wise, I live in a bubble, like profession wise, like I can stay at home and not be as exposed to hate as people who have to go to work every day outside, right? Um, I think it's been really refreshing, like in some ways or validating, I don't know, affirming for so many um, people to say like, oh my gosh, like, yeah, I haven't at all paid attention to anti-Asian racism or history. And um, like, I have a responsibility to do that. And I think that that's been a really um, sort of important aspect of feeling like, you know, as the US, it's been sort of this moment of the US realizing like this, this obsession with like black, white as the, the story of race in the US is completely correct and also complete, like very incomplete, right? So I think there's been so many layers of trying to unpack like 
history, raising awareness, trying to like maintain solidarity among people of color and, and trying to say like, you know, when people of color are the perpetrators, like how to make sure the narrative doesn't end up serving white supremacy. Um, you know, how do you layer in the history of why Asian women are so often the targets? I think raising awareness about how, like <laughs> sex work among Asian women um, and how it's been taken for granted as part of US military practices, you know. I think um, just trying to maintain that it's complicated and that there's not just one story. Um, and also that like, there's so much beauty in communities that we don't, are not privy to. Like, I, the, like one of the only stories that I've actually appreciated <laughs> um, about some of the anti-Asian hate crimes has been um, a, an article that was in the Indy, uh, Indianapolis newspaper. I, I'm sorry, I don't remember what the name of the, the city paper there is called. But there is a story about the FedEx shooting and um, the Sikh American community in Indianapolis and how FedEx was like a hub and what the, the vibrant feeling in the FedEx warehouse was that like black and white employees would comment on to sick employees and saying like, it's really different here. It's really happy. And like, you know, you all eat together and like, it's just like really different. Like you're, um, and, and I think that like recognizing those beautiful things is also one of the things that I'm happy is getting affirmed, but like, you know, obviously it's not nearly being done enough. It's just a constant, like I have a hard time processing um, all of it sometimes because it's, it's just so constant. You know, the day that Georgia, that, that everyone was sort of learning about the Georgia shooting, there's a young woman in New York who is a student at Hofstra who suffered an acid attack and like body burns everywhere, you know? Um, her name's um, Nafia Fatima. And it's like, it's constant. It's constant, it's brutal. And I think that there's been this recognition among Asians and black people, like we're suffering the same thing that onslaught the daily onslaught, you know? And it, there's different ways of recognizing how it's state sanctioned violence, I think. Sorry, I'm so rambling. It's a sign of how I'm just like very in it. <laughs> I don't have a clear coherent thing to say. <laughs> no, you are, you're doing a perfect job and these discussions are not easy and I'm just, so appreciative that you both are very willing to discuss this so honestly and you know this is a vulnerable space and a safe space and so we appreciate you sharing your knowledge and and your perspective and there are obviously a lot of layers uh, within this as well and I'm, I'm just kind of thinking about reflecting on some of your comments and just feel free to jump in but you were saying, you know, some, it just feels like it'll never change. But despite that, you both work in this field of almost to some extent, you know, you want growth, you want change and justice. And I just wonder, do you feel that you do it because if you don't take steps in this direction that things will never change or, is, is that weight, you know, on your shoulders? So you are the ones that have to do it. Does that make sense? I, 
I, I'm not sure if you're asking me, but I, I, I can say that, yeah, some of my colleagues and I have talked about this, that like when you're doing anti-racist or like anti-oppression work, intersectional anti-oppression work, like you don't really expect people to change, but at the same time you const you keep showing up because people also surprise you and you never know. <laughs> so I think that's one of those things about people is like we get very like normativized and like you know we go into our routines, but also like people are always surprising. And so I think that's something that I try to keep in mind is that like I can't I, I'm, not, I'm never gonna write someone off because if change is gonna happen, it needs everyone, right? And I think that um, Mariama Kaba writes and talks about this really powerfully. Um, <clears throat> she just uh, released a book of her writings about, uh, called We Do This Till We Free Us. And, um, you know, she she talks about what you were asking, like, You'll never see change if you don't, if you wanna see change, start doing it. You know, like within your own space, within your own family or your workplace or community, whatever it is that like, nothing's really ever gonna change unless you, you know, everybody does. Just try something, <laughs> just try something. Absolutely, and I'll make, sure to add uh, her information uh, in, in the information below so we can all access it. Yeah, I'm, I'm sitting with just this pondering you posed to us, to Shana about really the question is what's our intention when we do this work, right? Anti-racism work, anti-oppression work, and I really love that because sometimes it does feel like there's so much to do that there's no time to, to just stop and check in on our intentions. You just do because you got to do, right? There's so much to do. And if you don't do it, nothing's going to get done. And even what you do, it's going to be, there's this like urgency, right? And I definitely felt that, especially after Atlanta, like, okay, like, what do I do? I need to mobilize this. I need to do that. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and, and the striving of this, like, bigger change of what feels like unreachable and, you know, is racial equity attainable, you know, in my lifetime, right? And, you know, and I say in my lifetime, because I have this like secret hope, like maybe it's after my generation and these Gen Zers, you know, what I, maybe, maybe. Love at that, Gen Z. I know. <laughs> yeah, to all the Gen Zers out there, I, they're like my inspiration. I, I feel so hopeful, um, you know, and sometimes they're my motivator when I see ways in which, yeah, you know, there's people in high school advocating for issues that in high school, I didn't even understand that I didn't have language for, right? That nobody was talking about, right? Like my, my parents weren't talking to me about like what it means to experience like racism or to be treated differently. Like they were still just trying to survive, right? In this world and have enough money to buy food, you know, um, for us. And so, you know, when I, when I think about my perspective on racial discrimination against Asians and Asian Americans during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, I feel like it was just, it was just permission, I feel like for people to be you know, to, to show the sides that, you know, I think we're, we're sort of harboring already in this world, right? I think much can be attributed to the, the prior president and um, his presence. And, you know, it's, it's not just the people, it's not just him, right? It's the people and, um, 
So when I think about that and why I do this work and what it's been like for me as an Asian woman advocating for racial justice, I find that there's always this dance that I'm having to play, right? And, and straddling this space, you know, that white adjacent space where I'm both in this position of privilege, right? Because all of you know, racism is founded off anti-blackness, right? So I still hold the space of privilege while also straddling the space of oppression, right? So I'm constantly ebbing and flowing in that and, and cognizant of, um, and, you know, speaking of articles, there is this one article that I feel really captures why I do this work and what this work has looked like. And it was this Forbes article that had been written in January 2020, right? Um, and it was titled, Why Asian American Women Aren't Advancing into Senior Leadership Positions. And it's written by this, you know, she looks like a white identified woman. Um, and she's a diversity, equity, inclusion expert and provides practical advice to break through workplace gender bias. So, you know, she's, she's done quite a bit of work on this. Um, and she, in her article, she really highlights how, you know, on one hand, Asian American women are seen as intelligent, hardworking, technically proficient, but on the other hand, they're also seen as modest, deferential, and low in social skills, right? And that, you know, if you're too quiet, nice, you know, and you're too exotic, then you lack leadership, right? And you're this China doll, this like lotus flower. You're really like, oh, you know, she's so cute. Like, oh, so nice. But if you're not so quiet and you're not so nice and you speak up, right? And you express your idea and you feel power, you know, opinionated about it, then you're overbearing, you're demanding, you're aggressive and you're unlikable and you're this dragon lady. Right. So there's this constant straddling of like, how do I show up? Right. Because if I show up, I'm always having to play this dance. I'm always having to, to I always, you know, I sometimes I've gotten comments of like, why do you feel like you're beating around the bush? Like, why don't you just get to the point? And like, my family has noticed that within me. And, um, you know, and I've realized that it's, really manifested as a result of my socialization of having navigated so many white spaces, right? Where I've had shown up, but because I expressed my ideas and I was like, oh, this is how I feel. It's like, it feels like I'm being threatening, right? I'm being aggressive. And I've experienced consequences as a result of that, right? Where I've been punitized and I've been reprimanded for, you know, not really being a team player and really, um, not getting along with, you know, it's like, oh, because I expressed the same idea that that white person expressed a, a few weeks ago. Now I'm an issue. Ah, oh, you know, and I didn't really have language for that. Um, and it's really shaped it. But so that article was really beautiful, and really capturing that struggle, you know, and it, it spoke so much truth. And then the part that really has really uh, empowered me was at the very end, what the author writes. Um, and she writes, uh, this sort of impression management requires an understanding of the nature and operation of the competing sets of stereotypes in which Asian American women are subject to and often playing into or against stereotypes that are often created. When Stella and other Asian American women can learn to do this, they can escape their double bind and become the truly successful leaders that they're capable of being. So what that highlights is, yet again, the onus is on Asian American women to figure it out, right? And rather than acknowledging the system that's operating, the patriarchal system, the white supremacist system, it's on the onus of the Asian American woman to figure it out, right? And we are then yet again told to be burdened with this experience. You know, would we tell black women like, hey, once you can just figure out how to manage yourself and just not be too intense, but you know, then, then everything will be okay, right? And I think that the fact that these sorts of ideologies can sort of be touted and really embodied, um, 
you know, and I read, when we looked up this article, my, I shared, shared it with a friend, they had mentioned that this article was widely shared by a lot of people, by a lot of Asian American women that were just like, yeah, seriously, we need to figure this out. Rather than realizing like, wow, do we see how this is yet another sort of system that's playing into without recognizing what's happening. Um, so I feel that that captures for me, this is what it's like advocating that even as you're trying to advocate, even as I try to advocate, my own experiences are often made invisible, right? In silence. Um, so, yeah. And again, at least it sounds like in that article, it's kind of like internalizing that trauma and saying, putting that weight mm -hmm. on your own self. And mm -hmm. like you said, um, it's, it's the larger systems that are enhancing and perpetuating these stereotypes that impacts the lives of individuals. And then, as you say, people, you know, Asians are, are sharing this article. Yeah. Irene, do you have any thoughts? Um, just, I have a friend who's given me the, the term for this, uh, that it's experienced by men and women, but, you know, more predominantly among women, the bamboo ceiling, like, uh, she's been talking a lot about the bamboo ceiling on our campus and advocating, um, on our campus about, you know, just raising awareness that it's even a thing, you know, I think that's one of the, the dangers of the model minority stereotypes, um, is like not even realizing. And that's, I think that assumption that we're fine is a form of invisibility um, that Jessica was referring to, which um, as you were talking, Jessica, if you think about this old school article um, by Mitsie Yamada, um, who wrote this article, Invisibility is an Unnatural Disaster, Reflections of an Asian American Woman. And she talks about how her colleagues could not accept her when she showed anger um, and how it, it changed the ways that she, she was considered acceptable or not. Um, but I think that that's actually, you know, just to your point, you were wondering a little bit about um, whether or not that happens to Black women. I think that that does a lot. Like, I think we're all policed against anger and uh, just probably in different ways is what you're talking about, you know? Um, I think what you were raising is that, like, I think people have you know, it, it feels like white people um, and like white supremacist organizations, which is everything. Um, but it seems like a lot of organizations that are trying to do appeasement kind of strategies, like they may have learned, like universities are a great example, like they may have learned to police in different ways or in like implicit ways. Um, for like, they might know to like, talk about Black History Month, but forget to do Asian American History Month, you know? Um, I think that there's these ways that, that we get, um, our experiences get compared. And it, it's just important, I think, to, that we are naming all the slippery ways that that happens. Yeah, and I, I just want to add to that where, I, where the policing of the Asian American, Asian experience, you know, I, I feel like that article, you know, in this Forbes site, the audacity really to police in such an overt way, right, to say that it is for Asian women to figure out, right, and I wonder if, if that would look the same, you know, I think when I posed that question of would the policing of black women be the same, right? And black, would black women allow that? Um, I've actually emailed the author already and expressed my distress related to that and how, you know, oppressive her message is and how she is perpetuating the internalization of such messages because 
she's perpetuating the bamboo ceiling, right? By saying that, yeah, you got to figure it out, right? And I think that um, that's that's when I, when I think about Asian advocacy, I find that there isn't enough anger. I often wonder what would happen if more Asian people were angry about what was happening, right? Or if there is this also internalized model minority stereotype that, yeah, we don't want to disrupt, you know, the harmony. We just got to go along. We got to be peaceful, um, rather than than raising hell and saying, no, this is not okay, right? You are not allowed to write things like this. There is no construct for this. Sure, I can give a construct, but the construct is bottom line wrong. And it's not okay, and you can't do this. And you know, I, I've been developing my relationship, you know, speaking of relationships, right, of relationships I want to have and not have. One relationship I've really been cultivating is one with, with anger, right, and not just in a, you know, I really want to be like angry, like, no, I'm going to be like pissed, right, I'm like really embodying it right now, I can feel it as I talk about it, because I think what this is bringing up for me is how often am I in spaces where I am, end up talking about talking about talking, right? I talk about what's happening. Um, and rather than allowing the anger to say that, hey, this is wrong and I'm really mad mm -hmm. and this is not okay, you know? So I find that really present for me um, mm -hmm. as we sort of explore this right where yeah, it can be so easy to just intellectualize everything um, without realizing, without, with not just realizing, but without embodying. Like, cause, and I can see why perhaps, right? When I think about my experiences of advocating and how it's been received, it's, it's the embodiment is hard, right? Because I don't wanna feel this way. I don't, I don't, I just felt the surge of like anger, right? And like, I don't want to. Right, I would rather not, um, and it's present, yeah. Yeah, wow. I've been going through a similar process this year of my relationship with anger and where it comes from. And um, I, yeah. Totally. I've been also trying to just remind myself that like, you know, I used to get really angry all the time. And like, I used to be a really fiery person and I still am fiery, but like <laughs> in kind of in different ways. And I think that, um, you know, that like deep abiding rage, I think I'm afraid of it. Like, who knows how far it goes? So I think that that's um, one of the things that I'm trying to figure out or like learn, you know, is, is like, how far does it go? Um, and how much can I embrace of it? I think that's something that I'm really trying to work on. And also like how much can I learn from people? Like there are so many Asian American women leaders who are like really angry. And um, you know, whether you suppress it or whether you like dwell in it, either way could be like too much of anything is not good for your body, like physically, you know? So how like how do we find how do I learn from people who aren't afraid to show anger and you know if I start to show it how do I give myself a break afterwards you know to to heal same thing with suppressing it I think you know if I I've had to do a lot of intentional like learning how to plan my time um, in the institution <laughs> in academia because like so much of it is like suppressing stuff so like after each meeting you know it takes like I build in time now to like decompress or vent or breathe or just lie down because <laughs> um, it like your body can't handle it my body can't handle it you know? 
And as you, you both are saying this, I'm reflecting on what my mother used to say me, to me before she passed away is that that anger is a result of pain and hurt, um, which is, you know, of course, endured. And, and that onus, it seems to be on you, or at least in the article that Jess was referencing by Forbes, that, you know, <laughs> the Asians are the ones that, that have to, to solve their problem. And that's not realistic. And it, it takes a community really to, to really bring about change. And while this may seem like a bunch of words and another, another just conversation, we hope that this podcast will really be able to create effective change. So thinking about those who are listening, maybe those who are beginning their journey to, to learn about their own privilege and racial justice work, what, what do you both have to say to them so that we all as a, a community and society together can, can address these issues so that weight isn't so much on your back and we're able to lift that up and, and, and relieve all of that. It's not an easy answer, right? Because I'm sure, you know, everyone asks that. Um, but it, are there any, you know, tangible things that, and, and maybe this kind of goes back to kind of what we were saying about what happened in Atlanta. You know, there was that initial rage and just desire to bring about change, but that has, you know, subsided a bit. So how can we foster a space where we're able to create the sustainable energy or, you know, just realize that this is what we need as a people to thrive. I'm just sort of being with it for a moment, right? Um, because I think, yeah, I, I really want to check in with myself, right? With, uh, yeah, what does that look like? What can be done beyond just what can be done, right? Um, so I'm going to invite me myself to, to sort of be with it for a moment if anyone wants to share and if not happy to be yeah so I think that there are a lot of steps that um, if you're active on social media, um, like I know that people have um, really been asking about, you know, so that like there are several organizations offering um, bystander training, like how to safely intervene, how to check in with yourself as Jess is saying, like how to check in with yourself about like if you feel safe enough to intervene um, and what, you know, just, different ways to do so. Um, I think there's a lot of articles being written. Uh, I think, uh, you know, Google and read, read the things that are written by Asian American writers and make sure that you're getting a di diversity, um, you know, of, of that kind of voice, you know, read, Filipino and Indonesian and Vietnamese and and not only you know Chinese Japanese Korean um, accounts um, read read a lot um, follow people on Twitter 
um, you could give to organizations. Like I know after the Georgia shooting, a lot of people were giving to Red Canary because they do a lot of um, work to support Asian American women sex workers. Um, so if you are interested, um, AAPI Women Lead is another organization. Um, you may have seen Connie Won, Won on TV. Um, she's the director of that, talking about people who like know how to be angry and fierce and like controlled. Um, uh, so I think that you know people talk about giving money. People talk about um, educating yourself, going through some bystander trainings. I think there's also like a lot of um, work for Asian Americans to do among ourselves. I think that's something that um, has come out of, for example, like after the sick um, shooting at FedEx. Just like recognizing the, the ways that like sick, Americans are erased from Asian American conversation. <laughs> um, the ways that Asian Americans are misread all the time, like sick Americans since 9-11 have been misunderstood as being, or like Muslim and like that basic ignorance um, in tandem with Islamophobia has been deadly for sick Americans. And so I think you know, we have conversations to have amongst ourselves about anti-Blackness, about the fact that like we are settlers here, um, about what do we do with this model minority? Like a lot of, a lot of Asian Americans really do strive for whiteness. You know, that white adjacency isn't an accident or undesirable. Um, I think there's, yeah, there's a lot of things that like, we need to like not just write each other off about within um, a PETA spaces. Um, and like, how do we reconcile with that? Like all of the things that we share and like the importance of solidarity, but also like, um, I know that in Asian American studies, it's been a, a really long conversation about like, what do we, like, how do East Asians decenter um, ourselves? And like, I'm, it's something that I think about a lot in educational leadership as a field, right? There's not a lot of second generation Asian American faculty, but when you think about Asian much more inclusively, it's there's a lot more than we realize of like, there's a lot of Southeast Asians um, who, who are doing amazing Asian American activist work. Um, there's South Asians, there's Asian immigrants who have really different political standpoints and like that's, it plays out really differently in the US. And that's part of that like intergenerational cultural divide, I think is like how we interpret like what are the best strategies for surviving in the US and like what are our racial politics? How do we belong in the scheme of like US racial politics? You know, I, I just think there's a lot of like needing to, um, if you're not Asian, I think also just like being willing to ask yourself hard questions about like, why, why don't you know much about Asian American history if you don't, you know? Why is it that when I went to college, only one professor in the Asian studies department was Asian? You know, everyone else was white. Um, I don't know, I think that those are some of the kinds of things like to just look around and wonder about how things got to be the way they are.
As you're saying all of this, Irene, you know, talking about Islamophobia and xenophobia, I'm thinking about this movie that my grandmother always watches. And I just remember the part of the song where it essentially goes, you have to be carefully taught to hate. And it's like, it's just the system that that we grow up and so what I say to myself and and to our viewers today is be mindful of our thoughts this is a first step because our thoughts have power and thoughts turn into actions be mindful of also the language that we use and the stereotypes and um, I'm I do a little bit of work on sex trafficking so thinking about those women who who were killed um, in the spa you know some you know they may have been sex workers but also we don't want to stereotype and assume that all women who work in spas are sex workers so we need to start to critically mm -hmm. think about things and and really just take a step back before we and e and we can even critique ourselves right if we if we start to go in that 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 cycle and 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 put people into boxes you know say oh no Let's take a step back. Let's think. Let's learn. Let's have discussions um, and, and have these hard conversations because without that, it, it may be, you know, really hard to, to grow as a society. Jess, do you have any thoughts about this? Yeah, as a closing thought, um, I absolutely think yeah, it's, it's all of the above, right? In terms of what can be done to promote racial justice and it's having those hard conversations. And I think the hardest conversation that we need to have is the one with ourselves, right? It's the one where we're saying, how do, what's going on for me, right? Because I think the most important to me, at least the most important actionable sustainable step in any of this work is daring to just be with it all, right? Daring to embody it, daring to be with it. Because when we're here, there's a safety in a way, right? There, we can distance ourselves from it. We can talk about it, we don't have to feel it. But when we're in it and we feel it and we embody it, right? And the chatter goes away, oh, the turbulence within that that manifests it can be quite a lot you know so i you know i think within that practice you know it's it's staring to be held by you know um, there's a great teacher that i i really appreciate lama rod and he has this contemplative practice around calls he calls it the seven homecomings and he sort of guides through um of, of you know these different energies and in it he sort of invites folks to dare to be held by their mentors their guides wisdom texts their community their ancestors the earth silence in themselves and i love that because to me i don't think that i can engage in any of you know the social media engagement or the external any sort of external engagement without inter in engaging in this first and and so often when we don't when i don't engage in this and when people don't in many ways i'm like this is another way when the system wins right because that's exactly what the system is trying to do is just trying to get us to dis be disembodied right and when we can reconnect and say, you know what, let me just drop in. I'm not even gonna go read anything. I'm not gonna go post anything. I'm not gonna say anything to anyone, but the most important person, the only relationship I've always been in and the only relationship I'll always ever be in, which is myself, right? Until I can be in relation with that and be with that, well, the system will always win then if I don't, right? And I'm, if I'm really here to take down the system, then that to me is the biggest way to protest the system is to say that whatever you got to say, say it, but I'm still gonna check in with me. I'm still feel it. I'm gonna dare to feel it. All right, so yeah. Wow. Dare to be. Wow. I, I don't, 
I was trying, I was paying attention to my own body responding to your reading the seven homecomings and Tashina, I noticed on the video too, we both just like inhaled and exhaled. Like it felt like something was coming up to meet us, you know? Like, oh, <sighs> I'm not like breathing by myself here. <laughs> um, yeah, that's really beautiful. Thank you, Jess. Well, thank you both so much for joining Education for the 21st Century today. Uh, and I think our one of our many takeaway messages is dare to be, dare to do. And um, we will see you all again next month uh, with our uh, next guest. But thank you all for joining us and we will have additional resources below the video. Until next time. Thank you.